about the next thing. Not expecting any, but if there are. All right. So the manifesto portion of the afternoon. Yeah. So, um, oh, all right. Welcome back. Are we mostly back? Did we lose a few people. They, they have, no, they're here. They're up here. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> the crowd looks different. Um, so I had an idea for a performance piece, but I really, I did. I worked on a play uh, with uh, Mac Wellman on, on Marionetti, you know, and I wanted to do a performance piece where I just had a backpack filled with vegetables, and I was just going to slice them very quietly and carefully <laughs> as you were reading your manifestos at the thought that I could throw vegetables at you at any time. But, <laughs> and when I suggested this cool idea, Amrita looked at me like I was the same. So I know, I know, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, it's always a it's tricky business to ask people to write manifestos because, you know, who really wants to deliver their manifesto? I mean, it, so these guys, you've done a great service to sort of take the risk of your vision of the, the future of the form in the field. Uh, and so I'm super appreciative. So what we're going to do is um, we'll just sort of read them kind of one after the other. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions, uh, and then we'll open up questions, and then at 4.30, we will go into um, our breakout groups so that you can all really talk about them. So whatever we don't feel like we accomplished uh, in um, the question and answer here, we have plenty of time. We have a whole hour before dinner to continue the discussion. So, um, okay, uh, I don't really have a particular order, but I would like to start with um, if you don't want. No, because right. I'm right next yeah, to you. So, um, and evidently, David, this is what I get for being the last. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, All go right. Ahead. Yeah. Um, in the lit office of the future, we will have taken. Sorry, sorry. Could, could you, could each of you just introduce yourselves one more time as you can speak, because I've already forgotten. Yes, you bet. Yeah, yeah. Yes, please, Aaron Carter, introduce yourself one more time. Um, I'm Aaron Carter. I'm the lit manager at Stuff. Um, in the lit office of the future. We will have figured out the work balance between the time-consuming act of digesting plays and the equally time-consuming act of devising ways of communicating to audiences about plays. Perhaps we will realize that this is two different jobs and if we want one person to do these two jobs, perhaps we should clone her or download her understanding of a play into a nearby computer for implantation in the marketing team. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of technology, the lit office of the future will have embraced the ways information technology can improve our work. If Facebook and Spotify and YouTube can turn us on to new music, why not new plays? In this future, we have also figured out that literature is an obsolete term to describe a performance test, and we will be called what we actually are, which is generative artist talent scouts. As a guess, yes, uh, we will be uh, charged with nurturing, challenging, and otherwise developing artists. Of course, the best way to do this is to create performances, which means we guess have just morphed into producers. Future, you are so tricky. When I think about this in the future, future Aaron realizes that producer isn't quite the right term. It's more like the moguls of the visual art world, like uh, Marion Goodman. Um, acknowledging that the financial f model is fundamentally different, future Aaron is a producer slash mogul providing artistic challenges to a stable of artists. Future Aaron may or may not rock a scarf and a walking cane. <laughs> Present Aaron would like you to know that future Aaron is providing artistic challenges, not quote opportunities. The word opportunities implies a graspy tiered system in which people are playing at bigger and bigger venues with Broadway as the goal. Of course, Broadway doesn't exist in the future, but you know what I mean. <laughs> future Aaron's relationship to artists is that of a true believer who encourages the artist to realize her greatest potential. Future Aaron is old, so it's like Morgan Freeman and Million Dollar Baby. Only the artists I work with will not end up paralyzed or dead. <laughs> At least not because of their achievements. Let's just focus on me as Morgan Freeman and ignore the part where this simile falls apart under examination. <laughs> President Aaron has just realized that he has admitted in public that he wants to be a guru. While this confirms the future scarf and cane, he is mortified to have discovered this in public and will pivot away towards a new subject. Oh. Okay, well this turns out to be less of a pivot and more of an awkward defense. What, what prevents future Aaron from being some skeezy, skin crawl inducing faux mystic is of course scientific rigor and artistic discipline. Uh, between now and my Morgan Freeman days, I will have participated in a groundbreaking study of new play development techniques and this study will have laid the foundation for a style of work that supplements the intu intuition of dramaturgs and directors with detailed approaches for discovering the next draft that is hidden inside of every current draft. 
Uh, Morgan Freeman will have overcome that idea that every play is a precious individual snowflake. Instead, he will employ parallels drawn to the sciences of method acting, viewpoint, psychotherapy, and every other accepted system of artistic or personal exploration, all systemic techniques that are seldom accused of obliterating snowflakes. Now that the future is swarming with gaps, quads, excuse me, producers armed with non-mystical thinking, the whole notion of differences between a development entity and a producing ed entity have been obliterated, and no one sees any conflict between wanting to produce some plays one month and engaging in exploration and refinement of our discipline the next. The things we used to think of as theaters are bubbling cauldrons of creative exploration, and a survey of contemporary dramatic structures is as welcome an output from a theater as a four-week run. And this finally means that we don't have to retreat to the halls of the academy to experiment and to talk about our history and our future. This upends the notions upon which most academic training programs are based, making them moot. Our theaters will be where we learn, where we play, and where we learn to play. Because the place where we practice our art, examine our art, and take our art to the next level is the theater. And so to summarize, Gap's challenging artists, Morgan Freeman, <laughs> gurus, the good kind, cauldrons of creativity and never-ending learning, rigor, production, reflection, and evolution. The end. <laughs> snacks nearby because it is serious business reading plays. So that's the first thing. But then sometimes this literary office is the conversation at the big table in the middle of the office where the folks who plan the season meet. The mix of artistic and production types, a rotating cast of development and marketing who are different ages and have different tastes, but who get what the theater is great at and what it wishes it were great at and aren't afraid to argue about what that is and what it should be. So this table is a place of curiosity and respect a fervent passion of honest confusion, of disagreement and advocacy, and thinking aloud, and a constant interrogation of our mission, of our purpose, of our imagined conversations with our imagined audiences and community, alongside um, an investigation and interrogation of our past successes and failures in our actual conversations with our actual community. And for me, this literary office is located in a theater that's big enough to have ambition and small enough to know everyone's name. A theater that has a mission that's aspirational, that's inspiring, but isn't masochistic. <laughs> that knows what it doesn't do well, as well as what it does do well. And a, the a theater that's ruthlessly, ruthlessly honest about its shortcomings and expects its people to be the same. Because mission is really the thing that helps an, a literary office know what, isn't, what it is and what it isn't, what its job is and what its job shouldn't be, and keeps us from wasting our time or the hopes of artists. The 21st century literary office is within earshot or text shot of the artistic director. Everyone expects the literary office to be involved in articulating the theater's work and, the importance, uh, and its importance to the theater, to its audiences, to the culture at large. But of course, at times, the literary office is a coffee shop or a bar after a reading where you're winding up or winding down with a writer or a director or a literary type. It's the lobby of a theater, your own or not your own, where you compare notes and dreams with a colleague, where you trade pictures of your dogs or your latest vacation. It's the impromptu or long planned or finally we figured out this moment, meandering conversation, but some cool article on neuroscience or crowdsourcing or habit formation or maybe a play. It's the cross time, time zone phone calls about the heartbreak plays you wish were, you were right for your theater, you hope were right for theirs, while hoping to hear about plays you and your theater might fall hard for. And sometimes it's in museums, and sometimes it's reading stuff that's not about theater at all, sometimes it's traveling, it's in making a habit of crossing unfamiliar barriers of culture and aesthetics. It's a literary office that believes in hard work and deep rest believe in using all of your vacation time. It's an office lucky enough to rest on the shoulders and brains and creativity of more than one person so that we can attend to the theater's different needs, so that we can cycle through different needs, uh, so that we can cycle through these different activities, so that we can offer fresh eyes to our colleagues' projects, so that we can gather more gossip and share it. <laughs> um, 
It's also part of a culture, a theater-wide culture of paid sabbaticals. Because what I hunger for more than anything else is time to do the, to, is time beyond the to-do list of my work. Time to be interesting enough, time to think broadly enough, to cultivate the kind of insight and innovation that only comes from reflection, from work time away from the cycles of finding and producing and rehashing and interrogation. We think broadly, we think abstractly, and then we dig into the specifics of scripts of productions, of program notes of audience development and engagement. We go afield, we come home. Because everywhere the dramaturgy happens is part of the literary office, right? Because above all, the literary office of the future reckons wisely with the power, the responsibility, and the deep joy of its work. Well, I mean, it also votes. It has fun. It participates in big sales and the life of its theater, its city, and its field. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Otis Ramsey is away. I am the administrator for the Future Classics program at the Classical Theatre of Harlem. And um, just a one contextual note, I um, run that office by myself. So you'll, you'll hear that in my manifesto. <laughs> the future is a wish. What are your wildest dreams for the literary office of the future? One, in the literary office of the future, isolation and solitude are abolished. <laughs> no one is alone. Two, in the literary office of the future, community and collaboration are emphasized. Three, the literary office of the future will be a joint venture that connects several institutions, either by regional or artistic sensibilities, in an effort to share resources and work and minimize duplication of efforts. Um, literary office will be a system. One way that this system might work is that literary managers from one region work together to review material that is submitted for consideration. Um, at present, as we know, a single play may be submitted to multiple theaters, say 20 different institutions. In this case, 20 or so different literary associates are all reading and evaluating the same play. Mm -hmm. In this type of network, perhaps there is a database that tracks the submission of works, and uh, each play is evaluated by a minimum of two individuals instead of 20, who then report back to the whole group as a part of the evaluation process. Um, in such a network, it is crucial that literary associates have an understanding of what types of work will satisfy other institutions, and script reviewers will recommend plays and playwrights to peer institutions. In this way, also, the literary office becomes and exists within a larger community that serves both specific institutions as well as a larger field. Four, in the literary office of the future, gateways will be abolished. At present, scripts, artists, ideas, are met by a series of gateways um, which they will either pass through or, which, uh, or at which they are halted. When gateways and such uh, obstacles are eliminated, the literary office will cease to be a destination. Rather, like being an artist, it will evolve into a way of being in the world, a vast network, a series of relationships. And in this way, oh, this is why I finished, did not finish the mm -hmm. thought. And I um, also sort of dreamed this. You know, I, I slept on it and then I woke up and just wrote. So, so that's what's happening as well. Uh, number five, uh, text is not privileged over production and spectacle and scripts are evaluated as much for their theatrical potential as for their literary merit. Six, the line between literary office and artistic associates will be abolished. Uh, in the future, the literary office will not just be a place for dramaturgs and literary uh, managers, and here I also insert war managers. Uh, there is a hierarchical crisis in um, designating directors and writers as artistic associates or such titles while simultaneously having the, uh, too many pages, <laughs> while having the uh, dramaturg or literary manager, uh, literary associates as a separate thing. And uh, in the future, this gulf is bridged. Um, as such, directors and playwrights and others engage with the literary office in these conversations pertaining to lit issues and including season planning. Seven, in the literary office of the future, the focus will shift from new play development to playwrights development. Under such conditions, writers enter into relationships with institutions that are not based solely on one particular play, but rather on an investment in the writer. Also, since the literary office is now a consortium of multiple institutions working together, then playwrights, uh, playwright development would occur as collaborations and conversations between these various institutions. 
Then I move to the question, what shall we expect of the theater of the future? One, in the theater of the future, ambivalence will be abolished. <laughs> August Strindberg in his 1888 preface to Miss Julie wrote, if my tragedy depresses many people, it is their own fault. <laughs> Substitute the word depresses for any number of words, including anger, excite, surprises, and this will be the characteristic of all future theater. Uh, that is, it will do something to audiences, rather, however rather, than distribute responsibility for such feelings totally onto the audience member, the work itself will share in accountability. In this way also, there is an acknowledged conversation exchange between work on stage and audiences. Two, comfort and safety will be abolished. Danger and discomfort will be the primary traits of the theater of the future. Uh, director and playwright um, Robert, uh, Robert O'Hara once described his theater as a place where everyone is welcome and no one is safe. Similarly, Irene Lewis, the former artistic director of Center Stage in Baltimore, advocated that in the theater, the only comfort available should be provided by the seats. And so in terms of the work on stage, we should be challenging people's sense of comfort. And number three, in the theater of the future, Love will make as deep an impression as hurt. So lately I've been wondering if a person's hurt makes a deeper imprint than their love. Harm and abuse become phantoms ever present in shadows and land between, uh, in lands between awake and sleep. A kiss is rarely as shocking as a slap. Maybe this is just the stuff that is wandering in my mind. Maybe this is just the stuff that is wandering around my mind. Uh, hi, um, I'm Amrita Ramanan, and I'm the lit manager at Arena Stage. The literary office of the future is no longer called a literary office. It's all blown up. What remains is a place without walls where the barriers of ego, elitism, and exclusion have been removed. Its function is that of a communal gathering space, perhaps resembling a coffee shop or the DC restaurant busboys and poets, with couches, tables with internet ports, maybe a TV and magazines. There's color everywhere, on the furniture and decor and the people that inhabit the space. It is known as the heart of the company or organization, the critical muscle that pumps out ideas, insights, arguments, and questions repeatedly and rhythmically. The term dramaturgy becomes the new hashtag. It is not precious and is owned by everyone. Saying I practice dramaturgy no longer generates the response of drama what? Or the oh so familiar oh, followed by silence or a subsequent reaction eliciting confusion, distaste, or fear. When I first met David Dower at Busboys and Poets, by the way, he <laughs> talked about dramaturgy as integral to every theater company's through line such that every theater maker holds the mission and the vision of the art as their ultimate goal, even we, if we explore different tactics on how to achieve them. <coughs> a marketing ma manager practices dramaturgy by communicating to an audience the mission and vision of the art through website blurbs, posters, brochures. A development associate practices dramaturgy when they approach a potential funder, caring and articulating the mission and the vision of the art and why it needs the funder's support to thrive. A casting director practices dramaturgy in casting a show by supporting the mission and vision of the playwright's intent and director's concept with every person they call in. And we can't leave out the budding theater makers who are making their way into the artistic homes. This philosophy and practice of dramaturgy should permeate to schools, universities, internships, apprenticeships, where the first word budding theater makers hear when they step into a theater, classroom, or rehearsal hall is dramaturgy. I love Morgan Janess's belief that the origin and essence of dramaturgy is to provoke. We begin our provocation by releasing ourselves from the dead practices that surface as historical blueprints and develop impactful, vital ways of doing things that make sense to us. Shake up the presumably unshakable. We find our inspirations to change not only from our experiences at the theater, but with our experiences in museum exhibits, open mic nights, amusement parks, libraries, art galleries, dance performances, baseball games, and concerts. We are guided by R. Buckminster Fuller's notion of synergy, where the combination of two or more ideas function together to produce an outcome not independently obtainable. 
unique methods of interaction and conversation with audience become essential, viewed as the broth for a soup rather than the saltine sprinkled on top. I look at the audience engagement at Steppenwolf Theatre Company, with post-show conversations following every performance facilitated by staff, interns, and volunteers, or the Woolly Mammoth Theatre Company, with playful, interactive lobby displays that encourage a girl that religiously follows Indian Standard Time to arrive at the theater before showtime. <laughs> this idea of engagement pre and post show celebrates the experience of the art and the dialogue generated from it, rather than assuming that two or three hours in a dark house are enough. Long gone are the days when we took the intimacy of the work on stage so seriously and didn't care about the tone that was set from the moment that audiences stepped in through the door. During the 2010 LMDA conference, keynote speaker Adam Lerner talked about how we spend so much time being excellent that we forget how to be awesome. <laughs> the value of a fun, synergetic atmosphere and more face time becomes customary rather than an anomaly. There's a strong adherence to one of the universal mantras that we learned when we were kids. Sharing is caring. If we come across a playwright or ensemble's exciting work and care about their voice, we share our excitement with our theater friends and lay fewer claims to our discoveries of the idea that I found this first. We ask ourselves what's best for the art rather than focusing on what makes us look best while working on the art. We gravitate towards radical accessibility of the art and we raise our hand when we need help, trusting that the symbiosis of the sharing process will always lead to the best possible outcome. The other day, I received a letter from Indie Chi Productions, an independent theater film company in California that I had some conversations with. The letter stated that they were looking for new full-length comedy or drama with leading roles for actresses age to range 40 to 55, while expressing that they would greatly appreciate any referrals for material we find worthwhile and exciting. What an interesting way to solicit help from, uh, from the opinions you value and duly expressing honesty and specificity about your needs. That sharing process also includes highlighting the bright spots that we see in the field today, constantly acknowledging the people and the places that keep the work alive and fight for its survival. As I reflect on this dream for the future and look around the room today, the dream appears less impossible. We already have put so much of this in motion. Hello, bright spots. During the next few days, as we wrestle with the ideas of renaming the literary office of gatekeepers and yes men, it is my hope that we view the future as close as block down the street rather than five miles away. And yet, don't rest on our laurels that we will arrive at our destination without effort and dedication. Now, let's sit in our space without walls to meditate, applaud, reinvent, and above all else, provoke. It's funny to go last, I'm sensing some themes. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you will find this uh, themey and, and not simply repetitive. Um, I'm Julie Felice Gubiner, and I work at the American Revolutions Project at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. I used to say that as a dramaturg, I am the person who dares theaters, artists, and myself to dig deeper, to ask harder questions, to be more thoughtful. I have hurtled around the country. I was lucky to work at theaters others admire from afar. But most days, I felt like a functionary in a system so broken as to be making a mockery of my daring and training and hard-earned wisdom. I could feel the interestingness being sucked out of me and the work. I could feel a sense of despair creeping in and taking over my brain, heart, and mouth. I was assigned to playwrights and directors who didn't want to work with me or a dramaturg in general. And the pile that I was sorting and reading and was told was the most important part of my job and to which I had ceased to respond was meaningless and was making me a liar. So, <laughs> things are different now. I am expanded and lighter and ready to dream again. So, Thomas Paine saw it as common sense. We have it in our power to begin the world over again. So, let us begin. A brash spew of generalizations followed by specific suggestions. <laughs> One, we all have the same pile of plays sitting on our shelves in our email, on our devices, and on the floors of our offices, homes, and cars. <laughs> Let us call for an end to the submissions as we know them now. Let us call for the creation of a national database for new plays. If we pool our resources, we can begin again. Imagine the glorious moment of seeing in a snapshot all of the plays that meet your criteria, your mission. Imagine the number of smaller theaters, development centers, early career dramaturgs, freelancers from all corners, and ourselves 
who can read and populate this database with four, then five, then more reports per play and get paid for it. Our shared experience, sharing our experience. And imagine clicking right there to download the script. Literary managers, agents, writers, all of us must let go of some control. Yes, playwrights might see a more honest report, response to their work in such a database than they get in a meager rejection letter. But playwrights are not fragile creatures and should not be coddled or act in any way less brave than we need them to be. There's no good reason for us not to work together, and I dare us to work together. Two, our artistic directors don't read plays and our colleagues don't read plays. Let us call for more dramaturgs as artistic directors. <laughs> <laughs> I had enough applause spot there. <laughs> <laughs> Very serious. <laughs> Let us stop writing rejection letters, especially those that say our artistic director has passed when we are the ones passing. Let us claim that responsibility, own it, and accept it. These letters that lie have disempowered us and created a dishonest relationship between theaters, dramaturgs, and playwrights. And I dare you to accept that other people know as much about plays as we do. Involve your colleagues in the reading. At OSF, the season selection process involves as many as 60 people from all departments, including the bartenders, getting together several times to recommend and read and discuss plays. It's not that hard, and the payoff is immeasurable. I dare us all to surround ourselves with colleagues willing to make that commitment with us and to share their wisdom with us. Three, regional theaters have become inflexible as they are beholden to an increasingly irrelevant subscription model. Let us begin by calling upon every theater to hold at least one spot as a TVA slot. Budget it, staff as you can, get as much decided in advance as you need, get your company and your audience excited to embrace the unknown, but pick the work as late as possible. We must be able to program plays that are immediately relevant, to create plays immediately that are relevant, to support artists we love who have work that must be shared now. We are stuck in cycles of responding a year, two years late. We are putting our most important artistic relationships on hold for a year, two years. We are overdeveloping work instead of daring to produce it while it is still fresh with passion. Or may I dare you to get rid of seasons altogether? Create an open calendar in which you have just as many rules and deadlines as your production staff actually needs. Create a repertory, create a timeline in which different models of playmaking can actually be played with and a show can run for 10 minutes or five years. A double dog dare you. <laughs> Four, no one knows what a dramaturg is. Let us call for the end of the job titles of dramaturg and literary manager. I am a dramaturg, but that's not all I am, and I bet it's not all of who you are either. We are artists, and we support artists, and we know how to make dreams come true. We should seize and demand the power to say yes. We have over-specialized ourselves into obsolescence and we must reclaim our place as complete and daring theater artists, which is no longer what those titles imply. I hope those who find themselves out of a job, as I have, find ways to reinvent and let go and begin over again. I no longer wear the title of dramaturg solely. I am part of a team that gives artists the resources to have a life so they can make plays. I am part of a producing team that makes dreams come true. I no longer have a submissions pile. And yet I have read more plays in the last year than the previous two years before. I have taken responsibility and picked up the phone, traveled, and met people in real life and the virtual world. I don't sit around waiting for the mail. And I am a better friend to playwrights and theater makers than ever before. We must read books and newspapers and travel and meet other theater makers and people who make something other than theater. We have amazing skills, but we have become unable to fully utilize them or grow as artists and people in our own right. We must get out of our offices and bring ourselves back into the creative process. How dare we tell artists what to do or not to do if we are not willing to do it ourselves? We must be active and go out and find the plays, make the plays, dream them into being. We must remember the love of everything that brought us to dramaturgy to begin with. And although we understand structure, I dare us not to be bound by it. Ooh. All right. Uh, boy, a lot of things are, are I, 
I mean, pretty much can go the whole weekend now. I think we have enough ideas <laughs> on uh, the table. Uh, I have a couple uh, things I want to talk about, and then you know, we can uh, move out to the rest of the group. I, I, first of all, you know, this argument comes up all the time um, about you know play as a literary form or as a form that's a play, and then we've got this thing called the literary office. And a, a number of you said this in one form or other. But the, is the literary office the right name? And so. Question one: Is it the right name? And if not, what what, what are these uh, what are these uh, spaces where people are doing what is currently happening in literary offices? So, so thoughts about that? We've already shared ours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm making you guys talk just a little bit more about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a little bit more. I don't know. I mean, I was thinking about it when I when I came up with the idea of getting rid of the titles altogether. And that I, I don't know what the replacement title is, you know, I mean, we could call ourselves Fred, I, I don't know, you know, like Bob, Joe, um, or Joe, okay. Aaron says Joe, Morgan Freeman says Joe. Morgan Freeman, Morgan Freeman. Oh, yeah. Morgan Freeman. But I, I, and so I don't know the answer to that, I'm, I'm hoping just to ask it. I mean, there's a lot of people talking about calling ourselves producers or creative producers or something. I think for me what's more interesting is that everyone around me, I want to be a dramaturg with me, whatever their title is as well. And so what my title is will hopefully become less important. I'm an associate director. I mean, I don't know what that means either. <laughs> so, uh, well, and, oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I was just going to tag on that a little bit. Um, I, I think the hang-up I have around the idea of, of lit office in particular, I mean, I, I'm really interested in narrative-driven work, and actually reading scripts is a really um, great way to get that information. So one, I'm just recognizing that there are other types of theatrical performance that aren't transmitted via text as well. So, you know, how, how, how do we, if, if we're bringing new art, creative artists, generative artists into the uh, theater, like, how do we attempt for that? Um, and then also I feel like lit office implies that the moment that play goes into production, like, you don't touch it anymore because it's left lit land and is now producing land, yeah. you know, and so, so I, I, I don't want to be stuck at that, <coughs> you know, believe it or not, I have some thoughts about, you know, whether that lighting cue is supporting the ideas of the text or not, you know, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Yeah, and I think that uh, similarly I'm interested in a space where the literary office is not just a place for literary managers and dramaturgs, right, I'm thinking about the way in which uh, so in, in thinking about the naming, I'm thinking about a place where uh, there's a collaboration or conversation with other artists. And to this idea, this question of naming, I go to um, Derrida's assertion when he talks about the law of genre, right? And he says, sort of embedded in the, uh, the, so the naming, sort of um, as soon as a name or a title presents itself, its uh, purity is, uh, impurity is also revealed, right? Which is to say that the space where the name fails to live up to the particular naming sort of makes itself known in this present. And so that this, this idea that names themselves don't necessarily always tell us everything that we need to know about a particular thing. So I'm also very much engaged in this conversation about sort of the name and the way in which this name doesn't necessarily seem to capture what takes place in this, uh, this place that we're calling the literary office. Mm -hmm. Well, and like, and all the people that we are to the different people that we interact with. I mean, that's sort of, I mean, like, that's like, the kind of nice thing about dramaturg is that then I can, like, if people have to ask, then I can sort of tell them the part of my job that affects the person I'm talking to. You know what I mean? Like, you are a different thing to your season selection, you know, like, folks than you are your potential artistic collaborator. You know, like, it just depends on where I am, what I am. And, and that's obviously, like, that's true of artistic directors. That's, your, that's true of marketing directors. Um, and that's part of, I think, the, like my like that's part of where I'm like and yeah once I pick something like I can really see why it's a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's definitely a term that I feel a lot of what um, everyone was saying really, but about how you keep it active and pulsing um, with with the terminology of literary office because there's something about that. Um, while I do of course understand literary as kind of its art form that doesn't 
fully expand to the to the art that's being done, and whether there is even a set structured term for it, or if there is something about every person, artist, company that actually creates what it means for them. Um, and then, of course, in the really idealistic world, like, can we actually break down the barriers and suddenly we're just all theater makers? And do we really need to stick to kind of this notion of titles and structures and offices and departments in the way that we do now? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the, the literary office, uh, you know, I just see it looks like a library. Mm -hmm. In your head, right, you imagine a kind of library. It doesn't feel like the boys and poets, for example, as you kind of articulate it. So it's just an interesting, you know, is that the... Um, that the language, and I, I think, you know, one of the things that a number of you brought up uh, is this question of, you know, the, the kind of role of the, whether it's the literary office or imagine the dramaturg in this sort of creative process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I had two very formative experiences in my career as a dramaturg. One was um, very early on I had a conversation, I was, when I was running the Playwright Center, I had a conversation with a local dramaturg who'd been around for a very long time and had been really um, just formative in the kind of new play scene in Minneapolis. And the Playwrights Center had an award for theater artists and the most, you know, so for people not, who were not playwrights, so lighting designers, you know, designers and directors. And I went to this uh, dramaturg and said, yeah, you should really apply for that. And the dramaturg said, you know, I'm not an artist and I wouldn't fit. Um, ultimately applied and got it, uh, so that was great. So somebody thought differently about whether um, that person fit in it. But the other form of experience was uh, I was working on a play that I'd been working on as a dramaturg for about a year and a half or something. And, you know, I've certainly worked longer, but if we were in the middle of production, you know, I'd been in the room, I hadn't been home in, you know, weeks and months and days, and, and I was talking to the artistic director who proceeded on that day to say to me um, that uh, dramaturgs don't have as much skin in the game as everyone else, and so it was a bad day, uh, and, uh, and, we, uh, and we had kind of a, a shouting, you know, kind of a big shouting match in the, in the everybody else, right? um, and, um, but my, you know, so my question is, like, you know, what is the skin in the game? in terms of the creative process for, uh, you know, people who function in this world of, uh, with all these different hats, because I think you're pointing to that even Allison. So I just wonder, you know, what's the skin in the game and what is the creative contribution and how does that get, um, how does that get recognized within the terminology, even, you know, in that, that world of like, nobody even knows what a dramaturg is. Yeah. 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 Have you seen that meme going around with what's a dramaturg? The dramaturg one is yeah. a question yeah. mark. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> like, loved it early. Like I feel like that's like you know like I feel like that's one of the things. Especially like times when I see productions of plays that I have loved it, but that and then I've ultimately worked on for whatever reason. I wasn't in my own institution or being produced in another institution, um, and I don't. It's like a part. Like I don't know how to talk about it. It's not cheesy. Like it's it's like. I loved what it was and recognized what it has become and like that, like that, like there is an intellectual and artistic skill to seeing someone else's really smart choices, many people's really smart choices, and sometimes you see your own, like if I worked on it then part of what I'm seeing is like how, like I inevitably on first preview when the audience tells me what the hell's play is, like I always think about the first draft that I read, and there's something there's something about knowing that, and I, I don't. It doesn't sound uh, maybe it doesn't sound vital. Um, I can talk. I suppose there are other things that I could say, but the truest thing is like I loved it for a long time, and then I got to see it in front of an audience, and whether it's its first audience or not, whether it's a new play or not a new play, like I. You know, like I love it for like all of its like glory and compromise. You know, like like I know it well enough to love it for real, and that feels like that that I of course I so so like but how dare that person say you don't? You know what I mean? Like yeah. of course you can. Yeah. But I think the term skin in the game though is a little bit different than that. I mean, I certainly yeah. like I go in and you know, there's a Jewish uh, Yiddish term kvelling, and I kvell mm -hmm. over these plays. You know, the ones that I found in the pile or the writer that I've known since they were in college or whatever those mm -hmm. things are. But skin in the game for me is that I'm actually willing to play ball. Mm -hmm. And and I don't think dramaturgs have that all the time. I don't think that they need to either. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that's like a huge drama in and of itself. Mm -hmm. But to me, it, it's been harder as I've worked at larger institutions to feel myself that I have skin in the game. So somebody can say that to me and I would probably get as outraged now as I would at 19. You should have seen me at 19, 19 the level of outrage I could muster. But, <laughs> but 
nothing compared to now. But um, the uh, but to me, now those projects are fewer and further between because my responsibility to the institution keep me from actually playing the game. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, you know, and this is less true now at OSF than it has been in my previous positions because now I actually am in on the bottom mm -hmm. floor of finding writers for us to commission, getting them a check, making sure that they have whatever resources they need. We also provide research money and travel money, and so we are a full service operation for the creation of whatever the artists want to make for us. Mm -hmm. And so my investment in it is automatically different than it was when I was just sitting with a pile, maybe finding a play, maybe convincing my artistic director to do it, maybe actually getting to dramaturg it myself while I was probably dramaturging two other things and writing newsletter articles and putting together a season brochure and helping someone write a grant and managing interns and trying to be a mother. You know, so it's different, and, and that's not a bad thing, it just should be said. Well, in time, it sounds like you have time for the project. Right. You can't hear you back. Oh, I said in time with the project, that's all. Yeah, time to play the game. Yeah, yeah the only um, other thought that I'm having that I can share publicly, because I'm having <laughs> It's little voices are just fighting right now. Right it's there. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm thinking in terms of investment, which doesn't necessarily get at this idea of skin in the game, but, and this is where I think also we start to slip between literary management and dramaturgy, yeah. mm -hmm. but sort of uh, on the dramaturgy and sort of investing in uh, sort of that audience dramaturgy and preparing the audience for the experience with the hopes that you can give them enough information, enough tools, enough program notes, enough what, what, whatever it is, so that when they come to this experience, they understand it so that we can sort of be more validated when we get back to that place of I loved it first, right? Because it was actually the first thing that occurred to me as well in terms of, you know, as I've moved on from several institutions, one of the things that I've kept, you know, the first page of the scripts where, you know, I found this thing and I wrote a note to the artistic director and said, here, this play. And, you know, and I've left and then the play got produced and I'm holding on to that front page to say, look, I, I, did, I, I picked that up and I rescued it from the power, which I know doesn't exactly get at it, but there's, there's, there's something to be said about, about that, about recognizing that, that potential early. And, and well, yeah, and for me, I think it's the, like, yeah, I don't think that it even comes to, like, and therefore it's mine, as much as, like, like, I see this on its terms, and that is such, like, that is, yeah. Can I, can I, this kind of leads me to this other question. I mean, it's interesting, and I'm going to say something, I don't know, maybe intentionally provocative, uh, or annoying or something, but um, so this question of submissions mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and to that question of picking things up off the pile and being the finder of the gem off the pile, because that's, I mean, I, I you know, I guess yeah. from my experience, that's the thing that dramaturgs take the most credit when they do get any credit. It's the fi in the finding, right? Uh, it, it, you know, it doesn't go to the playbill very often, but it, you know, <laughs> takes some credit. The, so in that, so we've so we've been having in the sort of world of I don't know whoever's been following, it, but an ongoing discussion in the last few months of just submission policies. It started off with uh, because Arena doesn't accept unsolicited plays, and you know uh, David got a big kerfuffle, which we won't put him on the spot for now. But um, and then uh, and so in, in, and then you know I, I, when I went to Steppenwolf, there was enormous pride in Steppenwolf. Uh, that they were reading 800 unsolicited uh, 10 page samples. And I was like, okay, and how many of those have ever been produced? It was zero, as you would expect it to be. Um, and I thought, well, God, you know, what are we doing? What does that mean? I mean, what is that? And so, and, and the, I had one person in the literary office doing work, and her job was, hi, Joy, uh, her job was um, to, like, manage those 800 10-page samples that we were absolutely never going to do anything with. Um, and so I just sort of said, that's silly, let's get rid of that. Um, that's, a, that's a waste of time. So, and it's the lie that you talk about, we're just lying, we're not really yeah. going to read, we're not really taking these seriously, we're setting off to some people to read, we're having a conversation, it's totally internal. So, can we, but I think there's something for the dramaturg literary manager in the control of being the gatekeeper. Like there's some pride in, I, I look at the pile, you know, so that's my provocative comment. Like that we kind of like get bogged down by it, but we kind of like that we can it. So what about the submission thing? I mean, what about 1,200 scripts or 800 scripts or, and, 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 what, and about the lie that you're talking about, Julie? So I just wonder if you could poke at that a little bit more. I feel like it has so much to do with what your theater wants to be also, like, and being honest about that. Like, I think it comes from your mission, and if your mission is 
find plays that have from writers who've never been seen before, then then maybe the, that the temptation. You know what I mean? Like, but it, if it's Shakespeare solely, then like you know you, you already have your submission pile. Um, I, and I yeah, I don't think big submission piles are actually useful for most theaters. Like I think that is true. Yeah, I mean, I think what was always diff oh, sorry. I think what was always really difficult for me about an open submission is that so much of what we do in theater is based on our relationships and based on the way in which we connect with people. I mean, it's a live, active thing, and so this open submission policy to me kind of felt like a mail order bride system, where it's like you see a picture and you're supposed to get married, as opposed to actually courting and dating and getting to know um, people and whether you know not only are you a right fit for them, but are they a right fit for you and how does that relationship actually work? And so I think what's at least what I take more pride in, um, very selfishly, is when I actually get to meet kind of artists and sit down and have coffee and talk about the work and have those discoveries. And even if it's not something that I know within, you know, my personal institution I can, you know, produce, at least being able to share that knowledge is really, that's what's exciting. That's what's exciting is the face-to-face -face communication of that. I think that, I think the notion of, of um, that, that pleasure in gatekeeping is a default place. Mm -hmm. Like it's a place that we've been backed into um, as a field. Um, so like, so we, we, we want some credit for the work that we do. And since that's a really concrete place to, to hang it on to it, I feel like that's what, that, that's what it's generated mm -hmm. from, is actually a default position to retreat rather than something active. And if I think about what I mean when I think about the place that I feel like I had early exposure to that I championed, um, if I try to get at the root of it, right now I'm thinking that that the thing I take pride in is is the appetite for risk. Mm -hmm. Like so, it's less about like finding it first, but it's more about the notion that I or my institution or the group of people I was working with uh, were bold enough to to take a gamble and risk, and it paid off. You know, and so um, mm -hmm. like I feel like. That's when you talk about skin in the game. That's right. That's that's part of what it is. Is, is the idea uh, of um, of being being recognized for risk and rigor. Mm -hmm. I think that pile too. For I mean, for me at least, I can speak to a certain extent. In my previous positions, was my only access to the world, mm -hmm. and so. It wasn't that I, you know, so much that I delighted in the power. Oh, the power. Um, it was more, at least people would talk to me. <laughs> so I would get the email, or the agent would ask me. And you know, the, the first institutional position I had, I had a lot of fun in, in something that is now truly horrifying to think of, of like playing games with the agent so that he could figure out how to talk to my artistic director to tell my artistic director what to say. And then he'd call me back and I would translate what my artistic director had just said. And it became, and we got the play done, so it was awesome. But it was also thinking back on it now of like what silly reindeer games mm -hmm. that actually was. And, and that's a whole, I mean, I'll get drunk mm -hmm. and tell you all about that job. <laughs> but um, the, I think for, for, for me now, one of the things that I'm so happy not to have a pile for is that it's just me reading, you know? Mm -hmm. And so to be perfectly honest with the artists that I want to work with mm -hmm. and that I want to find that I don't know yet and want to work, yet, work with, that I can't handle a submission pile. And I can't handle 10 page samples. I don't see the use in them, I never have. And to actually find better ways to find people without having someone sit around for six months or a year to get a rejection letter to me, it doesn't make sense to me. And maybe that's me giving up my power, I mean, but it's also a different situation now than any other place I've worked. Well, let's um, you know, open it up now. Um, yeah, because she's like, like oh, yeah, I'm jumping over. Because so, so it over. goes to, to your suggestion that, that we're all sharing the same pile. I mean, we have to dispense with the notion that our discoveries are that unique yeah. in an objective sense. Mm -hmm. Our, our, our discoveries are personal, but other people have already, most of the time, the place that we deem meritorious, other people have actually already sent that person along somehow. Somebody has promoted that person, a teacher, another theater person somewhere along the way, you know, their playwriting teacher, 
you know, whoever it was has gotten them to the place where their their full script is in front of you. So I think we have to be not so proprietary about that. You know, that we actually have to acknowledge that and, and actually hang on to sort of in, in line with what Jerry was saying earlier too about the humanity of the process. Talk about the plays that we love in that with that in mind. That that they are a very that the one's reaction to the quality of someone's writing is as much about your personal uh, relationship to the, the material, the story, the form, whatever it is, as it is uh, the structural integrity and linguistic terms, you know, sophistication of something. Um, and and therefore, any job turns that you might perform relative to that play is a, is a, um, is a synthesis of those two things. It's never not going to be that. And, and it's a DOC product. We have to kind of own that um, as gatekeepers also. Because I think we, we're only taking, a lot of us have only taken pleasure in being gatekeepers up to the point where we have to say no to the people that we like. <laughs> where we don't own that. You know, we don't. We, we are happy to say no to all the people we don't know. We're not happy to say no to the people that we want to pass the buck for. Um, we've got to do that. Yeah. I want to speak a little bit more to this notion of pleasure, uh, sort of clarifying my position yeah. on, on taking pleasure in choosing a play and, and trying to usher it to an artistic record and eventually finding it done after I've left that institution, for me comes into place because I, I have such an appetite for adventurous work and dangerous work and work that's not necessarily being done. It's celebrating the fact that that play eventually got produced mm -hmm. and not the fact that I discovered it. It's like, yeah, now we're doing something dangerous and sexy and exciting mm -hmm. and that, you know, who knows what the audience is going to think of it. And I think that, that for me, it's more that than the fact that, oh, I, I discovered this play. It's, okay, now the theater is doing something dangerous and sexy. Um, so I just want to clarify that, that I, 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 it's, it's a complicated place to try to get joy in the fact that I discovered it. Because it's like, I didn't discover anything. It's Christopher Columbus, right? It's, oh, oh, I, this land I found. No people already lived here. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I just wanted to know that. Um, Tanya, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to talk about this mission thing, right? yeah. it's something I think about a lot, and, and I completely hear what everybody's saying about the sort of futility of, mm -hmm. of some of these policies. I guess the thing that always catches me is like, what is the institution's responsibility to the community in a sort of in a sort of social service way? You know, like that's what it like. That's where I get caught on it more than because I can, you know, I, I feel like as a form, sending ten pages every time I look at them and think about it, I don't understand how I discover anything from it. And I know that we rare, you know, we virtually never do the plays, although maybe we've discovered a writer who we then will ask, you know, that maybe we continue to read the work that we haven't produced enough. So on the level of actually producing work in the theater, I do find it futile. I guess the only place that I, I don't quite know how to replace it with is that sense of like, you know, particularly like always with the big, you know, big civic institutions that feel like they have some kind of responsibility to the community, even beyond the artistic community. I'm talking about, because most, a lot of those things are like, you know, grandpa, you know, retired and then wrote a play and sends it. I mean, literally, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. you know, and so, so I just don't know, like, what, <laughs> do we have that responsibility? Am I just, you know, and, ha or, and or how do I get over my guilt? Like, what, what is, what is what our responsibility? Yeah, I, I, I always think, what if we just put on the website, you can send these, we've never public, we've never produced one. Do you know what I mean? And right. let people still send them, like, be interesting to know. If we just told the truth then about it, you know, because what I'm always surprised is the number of people who think that is the truth, that we're really taking, that there's real hope. You know that we're like we're giving out that kind of false hope, but anyway, that's just a other, yeah, other yeah, yeah. responses to that. Yeah, go ahead. I think there's a point to be drawn between the different styles of institutions as well. I think that there's literary offices that are that are operating as, as part of a producing house that are that have so many more demands on them other than going through the new play pile. And there's also us institutions that are doing exclusively the, the submission pile. Um, and and I do take great pride in in, uh, in the fact that you know I'm not fit for for uh, human interaction at this point because I spent last couple months just sitting in a room by myself, uh, as, Otis, uh, as Otis said. Um, but I think uh, in that pride, there's also has to be acknowledged that it, it is a fallible system, that there's great work that gets turned away. And also the fact that um, uh, some of the, what I want to find fixes for are the, the form interactions that have to happen between playwright and literary office 
but the problem I run up against is that each moment I take devoting more time to that interaction is less time reading scripts. Um, and and there's, there's, a real, there's a real imbalance uh, there that, that takes away from the human, um, but also uh, gives me the opportunity to read. <coughs> probably tell you that my O'Neill scripts are going to be late next week. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I was going to send you an email, but as long as we're here. Um, but I also think, to me, like the idea of actually having some sort of a database or whatever, database, database, whatever, whatever, whatever something like that might look like, and there's a lot of ideas floating around about what something like that might look like. What you guys do at the O'Neill and what a lot of other places do, that actually it is part of your mission to have open submissions and to read large volumes of plays and to get through them in strange and ways that I don't totally understand and I'm participating in. Um, it's not captured, I mean, it, it sort of is now in the Google Doc system, but capturing that so that, you know, and we always used to have a, a joke when I was still in Louisville, I would call Martin and ask him for his heartbreak list. And so I could sort of then populate, you know, my list. And that, we all do that, but wouldn't it be interesting if there was a way to capture that in another way? It's not going to stop me from calling Martin or Tanya or any of us amongst each other. It's certainly not going to stop me from picking up the phone if Karen calls or Lauren calls. Well, maybe. I don't know. My phone doesn't work at OSF, so if I'm not calling you back, it's nothing wrong. <laughs> and I haven't gotten it fixed because it's kind of delightful. <laughs> But that, now I'm outed, but, um, but that, I, I feel like there are ways that we can sort of maximize what we do without losing social interaction and actually buying ourselves more time back for more social interaction. I don't know that that's possible at a place like the O'Neill because your mission is a very specific certain thing that unless you wanted to change it, you're not going to get less than five million plays a year or however many plays you guys process. But, there are ways to sort of open that conversation and make sure that we do have more opportunities to talk to each other and to artists directly by buying ourselves some time. And I think that's where we can also do better as far as I think those institutions like Sundance and, and WordBridge and the rest here of how, how in some sense we can take off some burden from the producing houses by having gone through that work. And I think that this database is an interesting way of doing that. But even in current systems, uh, and I know that we're exploring those ideas of how can we bring the work out a little bit more. But then we also have the issue of responding, offices responding to, as I often have to do, reports on work as opposed to the work themselves. Re, you know, responding to what some other person said about the work as opposed to the work themselves. Then becomes a real issue for me when we do a central database. Um, yeah, I just want to say that it's, it's interesting listening to the conversation, how many times the words like pride and ownership or propriety come up, and how few times I've heard like pleasure or joy. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I know I'm just, people have heard this, me singing this one joy note for a long time, but I kind of feel like we don't, like we're not talking about that. Like I don't take pride in a big pile, actually, and I don't take joy in a big pile. So, uh, so my pile is bigger than your pile, or side matters in those ways. It, like, doesn't you know? So, and if if it's not fun to go through that pile, where's what's the pride in the pile? Like, so when I, you know, I'm not in the institution now, so I'm kind of looking back at it because I didn't want to keep saying no to, to writers, and I didn't want to um, go down that road anymore. So, I just wonder like, when I sometimes hear people t complaining about the piles, then it's like so. Where's the joy in the job? What what do you when you imagine a day? What do you what do we want it to look like inside of Larry Alps? I'm not in them anymore. What does a day inside look like? And lead with that wish. I mean, what's the like when you wake up? What do you want to do? Um, and I just hope that we can maybe talk about like what brings us joy in the job because I don't hear that anymore. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. It's funny because it's exactly the question I was hoping to end the panel with was to ask that question. It's on the on the list of things you know. I, I, and I think, and I think, Adrian Ellis, you kind of pointed to a little bit just that question of living. You know, like one lives at the same time that one goes through piles and things. And so, um, and, and I just wonder um, if you guys might, um, you know, just really quickly, like, just like in a moment, because we don't want to take a couple more questions, but in a moment, just say, you know, like the, the like, what, what was the, your best moment when you were like, I'm so glad that I'm that I do this. Like what was the, you know, what were you doing that you were like, this job rocks, man. You know, like what, what was that moment in your, can you, can you locate one or two or three? Or 
three, but one just for now. But yeah, it's out loud or in our head. <laughs> <laughs> you, could have, you could have ten in your head, but could you pick one to say out loud? That's what I. That's what I was hoping. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I you know uh, I was cracking open a play with uh, my good friend and playwright Andrew Andrew um, and it was a good day, you know, and was and was probably I mean there are a lot like that. That's your question, you know. That's the joy of like having a conversation and and watching watching that new idea happen in the play roll forward. Mm -hmm. I've actually been really lucky to have a lot of them because now I'm sort of like Rolodexing through my head. <laughs> and I think just because Karen is here, I mean, one of my, it's more than a moment, and, and it was at the O'Neill actually. I was coming off of a really, really horrible experience of working with people that I was being forced to work with who didn't want to work with me, and I couldn't figure out how to work with them. And I was feeling incredibly awful about what I had chosen to do with my life, and what am I doing, and why am I doing this, and who am I? And then I got assigned, actually, just completely randomly, <laughs> to Karen's play at the O'Neill. And we just had a delightful time together, even though it was a difficult process. And it was a really fun time of a lot of people that we that I knew were there working in the design department. And Karen had already become friends with Deb Lawford, who has now also become a good friend of mine. And we just had it was, it was the best part of theater making that made us all want to do this after college in a certain way, of actually just hanging out and you know, feeling like the three dorky girls with all the cool boys over at the farmhouse. And, you know, and it was kind of magical. And yeah, I think we did some great work on Karen's play, and I hope Karen got something out of it artistically. But it was also just that time to sit around and just be together. and. Which leads me to the, what was the really beautiful moment was when Karen decided to share with me, I think it might have been the very first draft of what became Legacy of Light. And that moment of knowing that not only had we become friends, but that she and I had this also artistic thing, synergy thing going on, that she would trust me with something that was just so barely finished, just opened my heart again and made me ready to go back to it. I love it because I'm, I'm noticing a theme that it's it's uh, as uh, with uh, the two speakers before me, it's a personal interaction, right? I was at um, Center Stage in Baltimore, and uh, we had invited down a writer, Stephen Colt, to do his uh, a reading of his play, uh, The Thirteen Hallucinations of Julio Rivera. And um, Stephen had sort of gotten to a point where he thought, you know, maybe he needs to walk away from theater because he needs to actually live, but he can't necessarily live as a writer right now. And so um, the, the phone call and the invitation came at just the right time, and you know we rehearsed the play and had lovely conversations. Like for hours after the theater had closed, we sat outside of artist housing and just kept talking, you know. And then he went back and again he he um, sent me the next draft of a new play that he was working on. But it was such an affirmation because you know here's a guy who's at the verge of saying maybe I don't want to be a theater artist anymore, and and you know we just sort of connected and talked and. He wrote another play after that, you know. Um, I think one that just really stands out for me was um, when I was uh, working on a musical review here at Arena Stage, as kind of the dramaturg slash line producer or whatever those titles mean. And um, so much of um, it was the musical review about Duke Ellington and um, all of these songs together that were about his life. And the director had this really wonderful concept of kind of tracing the history of Duke Ellington through the review. And it was probably the first time in which I I feel that as an organization we all really looked at that mission and vision and said let's step out of our boundaries and really take in the community and really take in um, what this kind of experience is as a whole as opposed to just kind of what's isolated in the theater space itself and just really blow that up and so um, I remember one of the first things that we started with was um, we held um, two open call master classes at Duke Ellington University and Howard University um, to find young dancers and found two local, local dancers that actually live right next door from the apartments here. <laughs> and um, then also did um, these really great kind of walking tours together with the cast to go to Duke Ellington's home and archive visits where we pieced through all of these kind of original texts of his. And just all of that, all of that really in 
interesting and engaged comprehensive work was done on such a high level by all of these people together that it just, it, it really resonated. Every time that you were part of that experience and watching that show, you just felt kind of this, this uplifting moment of here we are all together just really appreciating the art. And all the community, all of the community. Um, well, just so yesterday we had a great season planning conversation, and there were like nine of us, and um, I got called on the carpet for not really understanding what our second stage was. We talked about it, and it was fun and funny, and it was it was just like people. We all do different things, but we carved out an hour and a half in our crazy days to like talk about um, think matters practical and not. And then and this is the theme. Then this morning, actually, Claire, you. Um, like a, a player who's like, don't tell anyone I sent you my first draft. Sent me a first draft, and it's like a commission for another theater. Like we're never, it's not about where we're going to do it. It's that like we really like, like these are real relationships, and I that take your choice. Do I do a quick desperate thing? You got a question back there? I want to hear you. Something that I wanted to share that I feel like is really reflected in a lot of what people are saying. Um, I think a lot about the book. The Gift by Lewis Hyde, um, and because this is the future, and I have immediate access mm -hmm. to all the things Everything. that I think about in yeah. my hand, <laughs> I'm going to share this one quote. As we're thinking about joy, and we're thinking about that question of discovery or ownership, um, you know, Lewis Hyde says, uh, circulation of gifts nourishes those parts of our spirit that are not entirely personal, personal parts that de derive from nature, the group, the race, or the gods. Furthermore, although those wider spirits are a part of us, they are not ours. They are endowments bestowed upon us. Um, our participation in them brings with it an obligation to preserve their vitality. Only when the increase of gifts moves with the gift may the accumulated wealth of our spirit continue to grow among, among us, so that each of us may enter and be revived by a vitality beyond his or her solitary powers. Um, and I feel like, you know, what I'm hearing like, is, those moments when um, you recognize or are in touch with that movement of the spirit of a community inside of a, a work or a voice. And you can help share that voice and, and bring it forward um, so that it can be received by more people and then shared again from there. And I feel like that's like, I don't feel super in touch with like that sense of ownership of, of a play that I've discovered because it, it wasn't, it wasn't mine, but I am proud to have been part of the, um, being the fiber that helps connect it, you know, and, 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 and share it and give it forward. Great, it feels like a perfectly natural um, break. And so what we're gonna do is, um, uh, if you need five minutes, you'll have, you know, we're gonna shift uh, lo kind of locations. And so, uh, or not locations, but we're gonna break up into little groups. So. Um, and you have the first group that you're in on the back of your name today. Uh, and then, um, Jamie, are you, do you want to say anything? Like, people are going to hold up their folders? Yeah, so whoever happen? the breakout uh, book cam folks are, please hold up your sign for breakout one and just go to the person that's holding up the letter that is your breakout yeah, number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Can I just do one quick second? Mm -hmm. I didn't do this at the beginning, and I probably should have, just so that people understand the format. This, what happens the, the next year, so these are ideas that get thrown out that are meant to spark the conversation in the breakouts. And then what happens tomorrow is that we'll work in a series of small uh, tables where uh, there'll be a listening circle and, and uh, the, the circle at the center that is speaking about a particular topic, and then those will continue to break out. So these breakouts are your opportunity. It, it sounds like we're talking at you. We're actually trying just to get to this part of it where everybody talks about what's going on. We're going to capture all of that in the, uh, both in Janice's report, but also uh, in the, um, through the breakouts in the, the with the little flip cameras, those are about making sure that we have your actual quotes, less about them being streamed. These parts aren't streamed, but they'll fold into the next conversation, the next conversation, and the next conversation. So what's going to happen now is, what we hope will happen now is that you guys will take this part, they've, they've given you the prompts that you'll take this conversation the next step, and then we'll come back tomorrow with a series of uh, the prompts that take place around this table and then move out into these breakout sessions. So uh, if you're wondering where, where do I get to talk, it's, mm -hmm. these are these moments, these, all these prompts get thrown out and then off into uh, the breakout world you go. So thank you for all of your attention thus far. Now it's time for you to... Are we leaving this room? Some of you are leaving this room, yes. <laughs> most of you are leaving this room. So uh, hold up your, your signs around there. If anyone doesn't have an assignment, please let me know. <laughs>